lecture series Wednesday night. Um, I was just saying to Wendy that um, this is going to be our first lecture uh, for the fall series. Unfortunately, we had to cancel the one uh, before, uh, but um, we will make up for you. I remember the, um, the moment when um, Craig and I were walking down from uh, this full French bistro um, that has opened on the back street around the corner from our studio in Santa Monica, and I think that must have been, what, 15, 20 years ago. And um, there, in the mix of uh, decrepit industrial buildings, a dog pound, and a sort of shabby bungalows, was a brand sparkling new walk-up apartment building. It had clearly been done with a low budget, builder style. The lighting fixture was straight out of Home Depot. And the downspout was PVC, but it has a real spark. We gave it a thorough once over. It was actually good smart, good symbol. Turn out it was designed by our guest tonight, Julie Eisenberg. Julie and her partner, Anne Koenig, have consistently brought those qualities to their work, which is simultaneously complex, straightforward, practical, livable, and humble. This last is rare. Humble is something that most people are not. But it is the defining attribute Think about it. When has spare, eminently constructible, affordable, and above all, reasonable structures been a ticket to architectural powers? The kind of integrity and focus that Koning as a convey on the projects managed to resonate deeply to many. Stripped down to bare essentials, rectilinear roof, rectilinear wall, rectilinear rooms, rectilinear fenestration, maybe some curves here and there, but mostly they have used a pattern of images, colors, and assertive materials to articulate sometimes to surprising effect buildings whose, whose usefulness and fundamental humanity has not been compromised by tradition or fashion any of the other viruses which so often distort one clarities of purpose. This requires no overarching concepts, no oracular adverbs, just a will to build, an ability to build with integrity, good humor, and great attention to detail. I'm glad to welcome Julie Eisenberg to SciArc, and I'm looking forward to hearing with you all about the latest project and proposals. Hi. Uh, some of you know me, and some of you who teach here have known me a long time. <laughs> uh, what I notice at SIA is, uh, I think I'm trying to start a discussion here and give you time to think is this is a place where beautiful things are made. But it's not a place that I get the sense that much discussion happens about context. It's that kind of dirty word. And given that our core studio has been asked to deal with context, I thought it'd be three projects that in their own way make, make the context work for them. So this is us. Well, it was at the beginning of the year. Some of them have moved on and some of them stay on with us. Um, we have a great team. We think architecture is a personal communication of people talking to people. And now I'm going to find the right button to move into this one. Um, well, that was us on the outside. The inside of our head is a little bit uh, confused. But it's actually a place where we try and reconcile everyday living and the things that we hear and see from relatives who don't have good design taste um, to watching people in the street just enjoying themselves with the bones of a city that isn't really particularly beautiful. Um, we subscribe to doubt. We think it's a good virtue. We're not about unilateral answers, but we're very keen observers. 
So this lecture about context is about relationships. Some of us have better, better luck with that than others. I've had very good luck, except that the one I got has a really bad sense of humor, but you can't have everything. Um, so the first one, we're gonna go in grades from building to town to city. So the first one I wanna to talk to you about is in the news. It's the Huntington Hartford Museum. It was built around 1964. The architect was Edward Darrell Stone. 57,000 square feet plus, of, which was vacant since the early 90s. It's a two Columbus circle, and if you've been reading the papers, this poor building has been taken a beating. It was an invited competition. Brad Clothill won it. I have no hard feelings to Brad Clothill, but actually the, we were an invited competitor as well. I think this is one of the best buildings we've done and would have been a much better answer. So here we go. I get a chance to be to gripe in public. This gets back to Brad, too bad. <coughs> So here we are at uh, Two Columbus Circle. It's in a little pink circle. And you'll notice Central Park over there. And you'll notice the avenues to which it uh, addresses. Now the Huntington Hartford, truthfully, is not, was not the prettiest building in town. And if you walk with your brother, or someone out of architecture, they say, my God, that place is forbidding. If you start to walk with others, you start to hear different stories. This is what was built. And you'll notice the high, which only came about by accident because the architect was asked to add more windows on the restaurant floor. But this is the most this building goes towards communicating with the city. Now, I'm not an architecture critic. I really don't have this right, but this is a lot of fun. Um, the program they gave us was easy. A theater in the basement, a lobby in the middle, galleries for the next five floors or so, studios and offices, a restaurant with a view out to the park and a lofts above. It had some incredible features. These uh, stairwells with the cut out uh, windows. Ah, now Marlon Brando didn't work here, but he inspired the superintendent who'd worked here for 40 years. And the superintendent was 60, maybe more. And he still dressed like Marlon Brando, complete with the matchbox and the t-shirt at the, at the end. And it's people like this that actually give us our first, well, maybe it's me, our first kind of visceral connection with the place. This guy had been doing this job for so long and this building meant something to him. And then as you read the press, you heard people like Tom Wolfe talking about this building. And you heard Herbert Bouchamp talk about how significant the building was as a, uh, as a symbol, actually, of uh, gay rights in the uh, 70s and the 80s. It's a funny story that sometimes ugly things have more importance than just being polite. And just because we grow old and gray and dumpy and ugly doesn't mean that we should be trashed. I think the, the, the memory of a city needs to be more generous than that. Um, the inside of the building, had a very small footprint, 14 foot seven uh, inside. That was easily expanded by taking the glass line out to the wall line. You could get 24 feet. Um, on the upper floors, it got more tricky. You had the stairway system interrupting uh, the space. And you had 19 foot clear gallery space, which was rough. Um, so we came up with the idea that we could get 24 feet from the elevator to the outside wall by turning the elevators the other way and redoing the circulation. Uh, but that meant we needed to put the visitor circulation outside of the skin of the building. Now there's one thing you need to know about this building. This is not a column and uh, floor plate building. This is not a corb thing. This is a load-bearing exterior skin building. So any incision you make, can you, is there a pointer somewhere? Any? Now, how do I do this? Oh, look, mouse. Um, any hole you make in the exterior skin, which had this lovely concave curve, you had to make with great meaning because it cost you a fortune. And these guys didn't have much money. So the smaller the opening, the better off you were. So we added looking for my mouse again, a vitrine on the outside. 
where people could be seen for once and you could also see out. Um, I knew I was in trouble in the interview when the lady with the bluish hair said, um, what did you think of the uh, Huntington Hartford? And I said, I think the building sucks. And it was downhill from there. The next really good question was, and I'd been inspired with this slump glass by something that um, Eric had done, I think, in Russia. The next question I got was, how do you clean the glass? And I knew it was, you know, it was a gong. <laughs> People were looking for reasons why not. Um, but you can see how it works from a section, getting people to be able to be seen from the street and to be able to see out and to increase the amount of usable space. And it drew on. This was building started out as a craft museum. It became more dignified and got a new name. It's now the American Museum of Arts and Design. Um, so we made the macrame rope argument and the glass argument. And uh, the other thing that it didn't have, which it should have had, now I can't remember why this building, this slide is here again, um, was the idea of water. Ah, I'm sorry, what I meant to be doing, let me go back one, is talking about the studios and offices up here. We had a strategy for dealing with the galleries, but we had no strategy for dealing with the studios and offices. And I remind you, it was a craft museum. So as architects love their own little coded systems. Um, but if you're talking to a public that makes things, and all of you know people who, are, you know, who make things, um, I thought it would be great to dignify what they did. And the pattern here, some of you may know, but most of you will not. So what you're looking at is the, the white boxes on a knitting pattern denote a ball. The angles denote a cable stitch and the dots denote a pearl stitch. And what we're doing was taking advantage of the tile system of the original facade, which had this incredible, uh, I don't know if you guys had to do those things in school where you had to uh, sample, had this sampler quality to it. So here was a sign that people from the Midwest, when they came to see craft in the craft museum, would know. And maybe others who had more education or a different bed would not. And if you knitted the pattern, you'd get that piece that we made in our sampler. And if you wanted to, there was a notion that you could knit the whole building. This is something I think would be really incredible to do. <laughs> Which gets us back to the slumped glass and the roots of the building. Now the roots of the building are clearly Venice, but it had this piddly little fountain at the front, which I think is still there with some cleaned up landscape right there. So the idea was that to play on the idea of the roots of the building, the lack of water, the incredible sight, once you added this glass to it and you looked out, you could get something you couldn't get any other way. And that was an underwater view of Central Park. Lake Elsinore, and this is the town. It's actually a city, but it's too small to be a real city. Riverside County, you know, Lake Home Foreclosure Central. Population 49,000, incorporated in 1888. 33 square miles of land, five square miles of water, and they wanted a civic center. 100,000 square foot plus program, and as it turns out, as we found out in the end, uh, Ming was one of the jurors. So she knows these people. So you know where the punchline is going. <laughs> um, and they wanted a program to propel economic development through enhanced identity, provision of new business opportunities, new community resources, and community open space. And we were one of three finalists in 2007. This is where the story starts to get interesting. So for those of you who don't know where Lake Elsinore is, you take that little blue freeway all the way down into deep Riverside County, and there's Lake Elsinore. And there's a lake. Well, there was a lake, and then there wasn't a lake, and then they have to pump the lake with water. It's not in the healthiest of uh, states. The red line is Main Street, which is a bunch of one- and two-story stores, and the red dot is the site that was set for the Civic Center. So for those of you into programs, it was a mixed program. Some of my students would be interested in this. 
City Hall of 51,000 square feet, post office and government offices 14,000 feet, a library 25,000 feet, business incubator 10,000 feet, open program by the entrant, 80 square feet you like, 161 parking spaces and lots of open space. Now, are you beginning to get the flavour of this place? They had come up with a new brand, which they were thrilled with, and it was Dream Extreme. And to Dream Extreme, they came up with this fantastic logo. And we would like to share one of their inspirational movies with you. And I can't see anything on that. Okay, let's see if that gets it to you. Give you a little flavour of Lake Elsinore. Inspiration. Too much inspiration. Too extreme. Too extreme. So here's the site. It was actually two sites. 
There's Main Street, the solid red line. And you need to make a framework for thinking in. There was a creek that uh, pumped water in and out of the lake. But let me back up a bit. I talk a lot about sites having legal boundaries as being a literal boundary, but sites have conceptual boundaries. In this example, it's an easy boundary to understand. It's the watershed. If you want a sustainable strategy, you have to understand where the water comes from and where it's going. So the setting has value. You also need to look at the connections. Highway 15 comes down, the main street's the main drag that comes off Highway 15. Then it uh, veers, unfortunately, in this direction, whereas the waterfront, and actually investment in waterfront connections down here, here are the boat slips, here's a little bit of foreshore path, but there is no connection quickly down to the waterfront. So we figured we've got to do something with the Civic Center program to get things to turn a corner. So we placed the administrative and office kind of functions in the two pink belts and figured that that would be an excuse for people to walk down the street, turn the corner here, maybe go through here, or drive down very fast and very loud in a very hopped up truck so you could go to the boat slip down here. Then you want to look at the identity. I mean, what better identity for Lake Elsinore than Lake Elsinore? So anything that improved the waterfront was going to create long-term value for the city. They had already invested in some park here, and some foreshore there. There was a small park over here. And we had the idea that they could extend a reserve and restore the wetlands. Now, when you talk to the people, people of Lake Elsinore, they say that their lake is fine but it's actually aerated 24-7, and it's getting cleaner. Uh, children are not allowed to swim in the lake. They say it's a safety issue, not a health issue. Interesting. Amplifying the effect. So you've got an idea about watershed. You've got an idea about connections. You've got your key pieces in place and a way of connecting things and then you say, well, you know what, I can expand this idea to say that what we're going to do is reinstate a green belt and bring people from the town, the small businesses that are struggling, and for the pe people of the town have a better connection to the foreshore, and that will also bring tourists, and that will bring money. So where do you go from there? Well, our rounded out program was some eco bungalows that made a conference center that were hooked into facilities that we provided at City Hall and used the restaurants on Main Street, an eco-center to go bird watching, a pool, a library, and a jetty safe harbor for the kids, because at that time we still believed that the lake was, the uh, problem with the lake was just that you needed to control the depth for the kids to be in a safe area, but that's not quite true. Now this issue of what community space is has changed. In the old days, when you had a civic building, the idea of a civic space was an ordered place where it looked like people were meant to sit, but truly it wasn't expected that anyone would ever sit there. We were looking to make a place that would really encourage active use. So, how do you do that? Well, there's the, the administrative section of City Hall with the market below, that bend that comes around the corner, the eco bungalows of the conference center uh, coming down this road to bring foot traffic and interest down here. The library for the locals by the water, they thought that was the weirdest thing they'd ever heard of. Why would you put the library by the water? Well, kids, this is a great place to go and you can use it whenever you want. Why would you put the library inland? Verding Town. Verding is a growing uh, recreation thing and, and if they improve the health of the lake, they'll have more birds and the ecology center that went with it, and then the little J provided a safe place for kids to swim. Now, none of this feels dangerous, does it yet? There's a pool. Maybe that was what was dangerous. Um, this was a competition, ooh, excuse me, go back one. Um, this was a competition, so there were two boards. I know in another studio, this issue of economy of presentation comes up, so I thought I'd show you the boards. What I didn't show you is where that, that view of City Hall is, hold on a second. So, if you look just here, 
You're looking towards City Hall, it's shaded, it's doing the green screen thing, everybody does the green screen thing, but it's useful for competitions. Um, and you go, uh, the organization is parking, keen to have service parking, we wouldn't want to deprive a car driven city of its cars. In other words, we were pretty respectful of how people were living. We didn't want to change, we didn't want to make them drive uh, Priuses, we didn't want them to get on public transportation. There wasn't a real reach in terms of our expectations of what of changing the people there. Um, as you come into City Hall, you hit the counters, and then above, if you look at the section, um, there are the council chambers and some conference facilities. So moving through the council chambers, you got to view out to the lake beyond. got to view out to the bungalows beyond. And from the bungalows, you could look at the wetland purchase that started to reinstate wetland landscape up the hill, and you didn't even have to go to the burning tower to see the birds. Looking down the hill to the lake, you see the library and uh, the burning tower. And happy people doing happy things. What we're very good at as architects is the, uh, the utopian vision of how happy everyone will be in the environments we make. We're also good at dystopic visions. The hard part, and this will come up later, the hard part is to evoke what real life is like at some point in the future without suggesting that everything is good or everything is bad. I don't know about your life, I have good days and bad days. So coming back to the overall view, we come down here, I think we should get to, well, this is the jetty they have now in roughly that location. And this is the jetty we're proposing. Um, all three architects had different propositions. None of the architecture they showed was historic. All of them had sustainable objectives. None of them took away parking spaces, neither did we. We actually made it easier to park uh, closer to the lakefront closer to the lakefront. None of this stuff was done. In that meeting, the city council said they were so depressed about what the architects had done for them that they didn't think we should get paid for our competition. We then went to a dinner afterwards, and this was the kicker, where they said, I don't know where you kind of queer city folk come off thinking that you can do something in our town. And that was it, all three of us quit. It was um, an unbelievable day about intolerance about other points of view. And it was a, uh, was it a good lesson? No, we had fun doing it. You know, they might even enjoy this if they tried it. But you can't, I guess, communicate with everyone. But that doesn't mean you go out, you don't go out there and try. Okay, third place, a city. This one was started a lot longer ago. A couple of wolves and a couple of twin kids, as I believe. Uh, 753 BC, although there's some argument, more or less, of a year or two, how they work this stuff out is beyond me. Uh, currently has a population of 2,700,000 people and an area of 496 square miles. It has a very large city boundary. Because if you work the density back for that, it's not that high. But Rome is certainly dense in the middle. The project we got involved with was the uh, Uneternal Rome exhibit as part of the Venice Biennale. We were one of 12 visions for the suburbs around Rome. Um, we called our proposal off centre and online, and uh, it was a great opportunity to think about the way we thought about things. Um, now, how do you think about Rome without thinking of like, things like Roman holiday? So I have another movie clip, but I'm afraid it's going to. Well, we'll see. Should we try? I have two scenes of people's on Vespa. We can either watch Roman Holiday or we can watch Fellini's Roman. Um, I, I think it's good to see both, if we're lucky. And why, why are the movies important? I mean, as much as the uh, Lake Elsinore inspirational video told you about Lake Elsinore, people's aspirations there. 
Movies become part of our mindset about how we visualize a place, and they stick with us. And this doesn't look like it's going anywhere, does it? Let's try something else. Ah, we're gonna do uh, Roma.
This was a tiger uh, kayak den. <coughs> Prostitution. Alive and very well in uh, Rome, particularly in the suburbs. Uh, outdoor markets. If you listen to this one, which I don't have uh, in video, it uh, you hear you don't hear Italian music. You actually hear uh, probably Arabic music. But one of the things about Italy that you, the YouTube thing starts to tell you is that um, Italy isn't just for who we think of as Italians anymore. And if you look up the statistics. You start, this is the Shahin Alam market. You start to realize that Italy is a declining population. So much so that it is, uh, the birth, in other words, the birth rate isn't fast enough for them to recreate. The only hope they have is to become like LA, frankly, and embrace immigration, which is something they're having a little trouble with. Um, and there's been a change of government partly to do with uh, a lack of tolerance to immigration and a lack of understanding of what great opportunities immigration will give them. We looked at romantic ideas. The Stalins about Rome, something that everybody talks about. They move in these swarms, they're absolutely beautiful. We toy with them over them. I guess what I'm trying to get across, and there's that red line is the GRA unravel, is that you don't, you don't get at these things through one pursuit. Take it away, you try something else, you keep moving with another thing. Can't remember what this one was doing, but we were trying something. Um, we looked at a whole set of constructions that would be along the GRA ring road that would enclose some kind of giant billboard system or some kind of e ecological uh, cell structure that would loop over the freeway. It was a beautiful image, but it didn't give us any connection to real life. Um, we looked at the metro lines, which uh, are a problem. They don't run that well, and you can't loop around. So if you want to go, this is the GRA here, right? You can't go around this way on a train. You can come out on a train to the edge. Those red dots are the stations. So we had a look at the GRA stations and where they intersected the freeway to see if there was something we could do. We were working under the um, kind of idea that Aaron Betsky had, had sort of set up for the Biennale, which was beyond architecture. How did architects think about things? Not by just designing a specific building, but by thinking about how we thought about where we lived and how we lived. So we didn't want to get into a thing where we were actually designing a station and a connection to a freeway, so we abandoned this one. Each time we're building a level of novel. Uh, knowledge. In this scenario, we started to look at what happened more closely with these sort of exploded uh, models, some in resin, some in paper, and it made fantastic shadows, but it somehow did end in two. But none of this is wasted. I mean, when I talk to my artist friends, they actually say that art is kind of the opportunity to fail, and I think architecture is also. It gives you the exploratory opportunity to try things. And from going through things more than once, you take, you absorb different ideas in a way that you can reassemble to make something else. So we still hadn't got to Rome. Uh, finally we went, but we didn't get to be in the middle. We spent three days driving around the perimeter. The freeway is jammed. You may as well be on the 10 or the 405. Um, and it's not a pleasant experience. The idea of the suburbs started as the idea of a balance between country and city and evolved through the 60s and the 70s with the development of freeways to be an idea of an independent lifestyle that was supported by mobility. It's bullshit. It doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't exist here and it doesn't exist there. And they have smaller cars. So we started to think, well, what are we going to do with this uh, cut-out pieces? And we started looking at uh, putting this thing back together in different ways, exploring where pieces, once you've made them rigid, not paper, so that they sort of pulled out, where the land overlapped, was that an opportunity? And we actually came to the conclusion that the pins were more interesting than the area of land beneath. 
We started to think, well, what happens if you link these pins? Which we did. And when you link the pins, you started to make a circuit that connected places on the periphery. started to suggest that maybe there was things that we could do that would uh, generate something of value. And I, as I just mentioned, even though the cars in Rome are small, there's a lot of uh, Vespas and small uh, uh, motorized bikes, it's still a difficult place to get around in. There's talk about the second ring road. So this one is 10 kilometers out, the, uh, uh, the GRA. We're talking about one that's sort of 20 kilometers out, which would be a second big ring, cost X hundred billion euros, which is probably more than what we need to get out of the mortgage situation, but it's a lot of money. So we started to loop around. You see the red line, which is the GRA. You see the pins. Um, you see a green, that green line that was evolving in a straight line when we put it back together. So we said, you know what? Screw this idea of a, uh, a second ring road. What if you could do some heroic civil gesture that would link places that are kind of disenfranchised and intensify development within a limited area rather than using that ring to spread it out further? So we came up with this idea of a fast train. We wanted the Italians to design it, although we knew it would be late in arriving. But we thought they could do beautiful things. As a matter of fact, they have designed fast trains before. But there's somehow, and there's a conspiracy theory for everything in Rome. If you haven't been there, you should go there and just listen to this stuff. Uh, and maybe they're right, because what happens is there'll be a deal cut, for example, to uh, build a shopping center, and that they were going to bring a light rail line. And before the project is completed, the light rail line part has fallen out of the way, and the big packaged big box retail center is still there. Or you'll point to a building along the highway and they'll say, they're not even building that to occupy, it's for laundering money. You know, so the, well, either it's true, whatever it is, it's mythologically large in people's minds. So it's such a distrust of government and about making things that when we embarked on this task, they said, you know, you, this is nothing. You can't do anything that's of value. It's an art project. Um, but anyhow, as we took to this, we were looking to notate what would happen if the train line went through. So we tried to identify three sort of suburban conditions. One that required reshaping, one that required reinvesting, and one that required revaluing. Um, reshaping. This is the uh, big box shopping centre before it was complete. And an exit is not a destination. This is how it looks. Nothing wrong with IKEA, nothing wrong with the day at IKEA. But possibly if the way transportation and development worked more in sync, you could have a different idea about how you would interact with this kind of uh, retail environment. Reinvest. There's so much crumbling building in the suburbs of Rome, it's unbelievable. They have some of the most beautiful and heroic affordable housing I've ever seen. Stuff that you guys would love to do with streets in the air that were for retail that are now boarded up with uh, all sorts of fantastic stuff. In Tor Bella Monica, which is the kind of equivalent of the south side of Chicago in the 60s, mainly inhabited by Romanian people, there is one community theater, which is one of two located outside of the center of Rome, which tells you a lot about where Rome puts its money. It sees the suburbs as pretty much valueless. That's affordable housing in the background. And this is one of these crumbling, linking structures in the foreground, which has been boarded up. Where we're looking from is a Tor Bell Bella Monica Theatre. What's wonderful about Tor Bella Monica Theatre is it had two great programs. And you would have guessed it from the YouTube kind of stuff that we'd seen. One was uh, the Romanian dance program, huge immigration from Romania. And the second one was a hip hop festival. So there's this whole issue of how Rome brings the idea of multiculturalism together. Revalue. I've never seen such beautiful landscape. And it's not a landscape that's gone unnoticed by others. You look at Poussin and Claude Lorraine, they spent a lifetime painting it. Um, it's so beautiful and so undervalued. Philippine uh, emigres, 
taking advantage of the park, pretty much like immigrant groups do in LA, group, uh, joining an extended family and you, if you, it's a free place to, to hang about, but it's not used by the locals. When you walk around here, locals meaning Italian descent. Italian descent people don't like to walk in the park, I don't think. Apparently they used to, it used to be the, the ritual in the 50s and the 60s to go for a drive to the Campania Romana and have a picnic. That doesn't happen anymore. But there are no toilets, there are no services, and it's amazing to see these monuments, thousands and thousands of years old, with uh, piles of toilet paper and garbage all around them. So we figured if we could invest in a higher power, We would, uh, we would rewrite the story and do a heroic civil gesture for Rome, which was this fast train line that linked the periphery. Then you get to the issue of representation. Here's one of those Claude Lorraine landscapes and the idea of what a journey in, uh, in Rome would be like, uh, around Rome would be like. What's interesting about the journey is that this issue that I brought up when we talked about Lake Elsinore. How do you describe life in the future without making it look shiny or making it look cruel? How do you describe a life that incorporates the kind of life you have? And a lot of the things about working with players are to put yourself in that place. So it's important for me, for example, that Marlon Brando character who was a superintendent allowed me to make a personal connection. Trying to place ourselves in Rome as somebody in the future taking a journey on a train meant that you were in the middle of life using the train to do other things. And it wasn't about making everybody smiley and happy on a train. Um, in the end, we came up with this idea of a pillow. And what happens, this is the exhibit in Rome, what you're seeing in the back, this is a projection of the unbundling of the city. And in the foreground is a pillow that's inflated. It's a, about eight, eight foot square. And on one side is projected images from the freeway that we took. And on the other, a collection of sort of filmic images of travel in the future on the train. And the airspace between uh, the two uh, surfaces makes the uh, images look more 3D. Now, if we're lucky, we get to see the mock-up uh, uh, thing that we did in our office to test this strategy. Um, and if we're not, I'll show you a bunch of still images. <laughs> so let's see what happens. Do you think it's downloaded by now? Oh, on which?
but in Torbella Monica that had a world music festival. These are all sort of small human gestures at, um, at something. And I just want to share with you, and I know it hasn't been a very long lecture, but I hope we have a, a discussion about this because I think context is one of those issues that I think we've been avoiding uh, culturally as architects because it became so much about fitting in. I don't think context is about fitting in. I think context is about a game of revealing. So this G.K. Chesterton quote works for me. The function of the imagination is not to make strange things settle, but to make settled things strange. Thank you. That it is, uh, you know, the, the project for uh, for Rome. Yeah. Um, you were mainly focusing on transportation as a way of weaving back and creating a new context and a new right. life uh, for, for for the city. And I'm just I'm just curious in terms of when you were beginning to show uh, a, a certain kind of narrative and experience of going through the city through motion, yeah. which what Rome is to a certain extent when you go to the center of the city is all pedestrian and I'd just like you to, to kind of address those two pedestrian versus... Pedestrian state. versus different kinds of mobility. Mobility in, in Italy, which I think is, is has has this duality in terms of, you know, how do you... Mobility in, in Italy is different. Mobility is stressful. And they're so stressed getting from one place to the other that when you go along one of those arterial roads with people who live there, they don't even see what's beautiful. They are so irritated by the person behind them and the person in front of them. Um, it was an extraordinary thing. But I was told you cannot get Italians out of their cars. Forget about it. Um, the reason the trains don't work arterially very well, and mainly they serve the same way that public transportation has historically here, has served uh, immigrants, doesn't serve um, Roman-born, Italian-born. That's the wrong word either, but because eventually immigrants have kids in the places they are and they're Italian-born and they're Roman-born and should have the same rights. Um, but Italian descent, let's try that. They don't use the railways. Um, and then there's this, so there's this kind of split Culture. If, you, if you look at who's doing all the service jobs in the pedestrian-oriented area of uh, Rome, it's Philippines, it's Romanians, it's Poles. Poles control the construction industry. If you want anything done, it's not going to be done by an Italian. There's a real problem because of the breakdown of this system relative to what the Italians were so known for, which was craft, because there is no apprenticing, apprenticing system for this Room. It's a fascinating system. Once you get onto the freeway, people behave and their lifestyle kind of looks like it does in LA, except houses are built in denser groupings. That's probably the main difference. But when you get to the suburbs, most of the places don't have a place where you can walk from A to B. You go to the place, you park in the most erratic way you can near the building, because parking generally isn't provided, and you make your way up into your building. And then you get into your car and you go to a supermarket two or three miles down the road. And there is a huge amount of undedicated space that's neither parking, nor roadway, nor sidewalk, nor anything. What Rome has going for it is that it looks like a lot of the large amounts of land that are in city hands or in, um, uh, owned by the church. 
but it's really unclear. We went to try and look for ownership patterns and that hit a pretty good dead end as I remember. Does that kind of answer your question or have I avoided it? Well, <laughs> yes, but I actually am interested in, 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 in another thing, which is Rome has always been, um, uh, it's a place, it's, 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 we've learned a lot of lessons from the city about placemaking. Yes. And but every lesson it tells us is stuff that we teach, we don't teach in school anymore. Everything that happens in Rome in the center, if you put that in your project, you'd get, you'd get slaughtered. The idea of pedestrian space, as represented by eternal Rome, is so reviled among architects at the moment that it's very sad. I'm not saying that you need to put shutters or arches or whatever it is, but the idea about the spaces that you come across and the way people collect is something that is truly wonderful to experience. Now I know this generation of people connect in ways quite different. I mean, your connection to through your phone, through your texting, through YouTube, and yet, and I think what you've given up is the experience between YouTube and your text message and your restaurant. It's as if it doesn't exist. And I think you get a richer life where you actually make human contact as well as your YouTube contact and your texting contact. And all those other technological wonders that make life better. It's not about a, Rus a pre Ruskin kind of thing that we need to go back because you know life is changing poorly. We should, you know, the past is better than the future. I think it's about being clever enough to take from the past in a way that's useful for the future before we lose any opportunity to have that. Anyone? Yes. Oh, good, okay. And I want to first commend you for uh, the breadth of uh, projects that you, you take on. Uh, and we lose. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm more interested in like Elton. Mm -hmm. How do you see engaging, because this is a, a problem of, of all working architects. Yeah. can do so much. You can put possibilities out there, but unless they have someone in planning or on city council who wants to invest in actually consciousness raising. So before you go about putting out a competition like that, you actually have to get your community to understand what the value is. And that takes uh, investment in a way that that town didn't want to do. I don't mean you know a little bit about the people there too. Yes, I mean, I, I, it's interesting that you, you, you ask that question because uh, the jury, were, we were very aware of the resistance of the city of Lake Elsinore towards any kind of contemporary architecture or even modern architecture. They, and they were adamant uh, with maintaining a certain kind of uh, classicism they keep on looking at mission style architecture. Interestingly enough, there was a person who was on the uh, city planning, a young man, a real advocate for bringing the city, looking at the future, meaning you can't look backward. And I, I don't know whether he was fired, but he was a person who brought, who thought that the competition was a way for the city to learn and to, you know, to open, to expand their vision. And, um, but if you are the only person, the sole voice, it's very difficult to convince anyone. So even though you have somebody from the city planning, it didn't work. And we as jurors were trying to... And it doesn't reach any deeper than that. What we're trying to do in the studio, and it's, it's difficult, everyone's struggling, and I think they're all pissed with me. I don't kind of blame them. But I don't know the answer to this either. But the idea is if we could make a, 
a set of, another set of rules that you could say, well, you know, we have, we've got as far as humour, so this is as far as I can get with it. Humour implies a relationship between one thing and another to come off. You kind of have to know what the context of the something is to make it work. If we can say there are certain qualities that bring smiles to people's faces, and if you have enough of these qualities, irrespective of style and all that other kind of stuff, you set up another framework for making decisions. Now, I don't know how to get there, because I can see how easy it is for jurisdictions to look at ornament and materials, because it's literal. They know how to check the box. And we legislate, okay. And legislate, yeah. You've got to get the right words for it. But you know, we worked at the farmer's market in Third and Fairfax, it's a funny story about pedestrian space. And the people at the farmer's market, um, it's the it's the old part, right? The people at the farmer's market um, wanted to preserve the market, but they didn't want another layer of historic oversight because it made it really hard for their small retailers to get permits. And a clever lawyer came up with the idea is what we'll regulate is the aisleways. So technically, there is no restriction on the style of building within the farmer's market. There is only a restriction on how they can uh, consolidate or change the aisleways. That's the kind of clever thinking you have to bring to the task. So it's uh, it's how to change the focus from the object to the space. And um, I hope we get somewhere through the quarter, <laughs> through the semester. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, one question over there. You nailed it, you said you need more architects. Years ago, and it was, um, it's like, uh, the, I guess the example is why do you think so many laws are, 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 take, are, are to the advantage of the lawyers? Because they're the ones making the decisions in the legislative body. Most legislators and senators are lawyers first. And, and some of us have to just say, okay, well, we will do our architecture for the good of the people rather than for the good of our, our, our office, shall we say. Well, I think you've got to do both. And I've got a partner who's a planning commissioner in the city of Santa Monica, Pew Scarpa. Um, uh, Gwen Pew is a planning commissioner. There are good architects doing public service around the city in different ways, but the more that you get involved in the legislative aspect of it, the more you can change the way people think, because you're not the strange person dressed in black coming from the, from the city. You're someone that they know over a drink builds trust. So yeah, in a kind of funny way, uh, going out to dinner with people <laughs> in power and becoming part of that power system is the way you change it. Uh, also, I have another question, another comment. I remember when, uh, years ago, I was on that, sorry, and uh, he suggested, and I, it kind of resonates in here, is we have these little cars and you just need to get to your location and it, the car would be like a shopping cart where no one would own it, you would just it'd be the public use, and you could just go there, um, you know, maybe public transportation, yeah. and uh, hop in this little car, you drive around your destination, as long as you return it where you picked it up. Well, it you mean like, it's a like, zip car system. Exactly, yeah. But we were hoping to put a zip car system into Rome, but uh, then we showed one at uh, the shopping center. We showed a tree at the shopping center, there were no trees in the shopping center. So, yeah. Actually, I had a question on the Rome project. I haven't been there or anything, but I was just listening to the way you were talking about it. Right. And you, the, I understood, I followed along in sort of the, the ring road and how to play off the ring yeah. road. But when you were talking about the park space, because park space is really weird here, and you made it seem really weird there, like the, it was rather it similar. Yeah. But your your input in it you were saying to revalue it was to place some kind of a business center that would add that would add you know a minimal function to it why wouldn't you look more at something that would sort of revalue the the experience of seeing the ruins because that's what you really show in your images um maybe too much time in uh, in the field and wondering what you could actually do and what would fit their expectation of lifestyle. What I notice with Italians is that they don't walk with coffee. They sit with coffee. And when they sit with coffee, you have a chance of getting a bathroom built. And when you have a bathroom built, you start to, uh, you know, a bathroom and you have a, a somewhere to sit, then the, 
the ruin is actually people take more interest. They're sitting there looking at it. I mean, you start to well, make it. it put the bathroom on the ruin. No, the, the coffee shop. On the ruin? Yeah. Yeah. No, no problem. One of the one, one of the most wonderful things we came across, and I didn't discuss it. That's, you're absolutely right. Is one of the most incredible juxtapositions is uh, the ruins and then a train line running through somewhere where it shouldn't, or uh, a netting fence that made the most beautiful uh, scrim to look through, and you saw them in the background. Old and new together is fantastic. You know what? The idea of putting the uh, the coffee shop on top of the ruin, brilliant. I wish I'd thought of it. It's really clever. So it, yes, that would revalue. That would say this is a cool place to be. Come sit. Yeah, it just seems yeah. to go along with your whole. Yeah, that's a good idea. Society with the basic Mayberry feel to it and just subtly changing things on them. Maybe just even. It was dirt. It. There was nothing to change. It's dirt. Huh? Just dirt. That slide I showed with the trucks, that's the site. It's dirt. No, what I'm trying to say is their idea of a small town. Like I was saying, like the Mayberry idea, how you were showing the yeah. public space, how they looked at it. The civic building here, a bunch of places where benches were there just as ornaments, basically. And try to just subtly change that idea to the building sort of just bring something completely new. In other words, introducing small modern concepts or deforming. We were, we were looking at social structures that were small mom and pop, but architecture that actually made enough of a bump <coughs> in people's consciousness that they could uh, get excited about new opportunities. So what was very old fashioned about the model or the socialist about the model was that instead of building a conference for Center by Comfort Inn or uh, Hampton Suites, we said, let's use the small businesses downtown that have um, uh, food stores and things in them and let them benefit from the extra people being on the site because those restaurants would be the restaurants used by the people at the Pico Bungalow Conference Center. Let's put the conference facility in City Hall, so City Hall can rent it and maybe get some extra money. I mean, I can see a, an Apple conference or a, you know, it's people who are interested in getting together in a, a setting, learning, in an environmental setting, and, uh, well, we have to do it all the time with a nail salon and a blah, 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 and blah, blah, right? But is there so, any way you could have repackaged it for them? Like, the um, you know what, we were, the three architects were so insulted by people deriding uh, gay people for one thing and thinking that we had, you know, you get it, we got out of that dinner and we said, you know what, this has been a complete waste of time. One guy, Brian Healy, had come from Boston. He just couldn't believe it. And we said, you know, these are not people to work with. We suggested the local guy that was closest from San Diego work one on one with the city. We said, we'd all be happy, the other two, that's me and Brian, we said, you guys, you, you take it, we're happy for you to have it. And they just, they too thought that politically it was right for them to say no. They couldn't work with them. So these guys burnt the bridge, they wanted the bridge burned. Okay, now you can go to other things. I know this uh, scripting studio that you have to get to. And um, I've enjoyed talking with you, thank you very much.